We are heading back to Alaska today to hear about the Keelick Lodge experience. This is the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, episode 130. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. If you've been enjoying the podcast and want to support the show, head over to wetflyswing.com slash members and sign up for our member society. It sounds uh, a little official, but it's just a way to support the show at about $5 a month. You can show your support and get a few bonuses. One of the bonuses I'm setting up now and uh, in the future here are a few local events and some meetups uh, in selected areas around the country. If you want to hear more, head over to wetflyswing.com slash members uh, to support the show and your journey. In today's episode, we hear from Bryce Rushbrook, who is an Alaskan guide out of the Keelick Lodge area in Bristol Bay. We hear about the guide's life and how he was able to get started up there with limited experience, what the seasons are like in Alaska, and a number of tips and tricks if you're planning a trip this year. Kyle covers some DIY bonuses uh, as well. Since 1977, the Fly Fishing and Tying Journal has long been considered the Angler's Magazine, with original how-tos and technical articles written by the best trout and steelhead anglers in the West. FTJ is committed to sharing exceptionally written essays, fiction, poetry, and in-depth guides to fly fishing destinations. FTJ is one of my go-to magazines, and if you haven't checked it out recently, you can get started by calling 1-800-541-9498 or heading over to the web at ftjangler.com. So... Without further ado, here's Bryce Rushbrook from Keelick Lodge. How's it going? Good, man. Good, good. Uh, thanks for coming on. We, um, I guess, Kyle connected us, which is which has been pretty cool. We, we chatted. Uh, we've been talking a little bit about the this uh, Keelick Lodge and everything going on up there. And I've been trying to put together a trip, so I, I just want to dig into a little bit of your guiding up there, and I think you're uh, one of the main guys trying to get people to fish, so we're going to get into that, but can you first start us off and talk about how you first got into fly fishing? Yeah, I was uh, I was kind of late to the game. I don't think I started fly fishing until I was pretty much out of college, and uh, you know, kind of started slow, fishing some local spring creeks down here and things like that, and then that progressed and over the series the next few years i decided i was pretty serious about it and uh ended up out at a guide school out in montana i was just kind of looking for a a foot in the door into the industry if you will and uh never had any intentions of going to alaska or anything like that and uh yeah that opportunity came up just a couple months after i was out of there and, and i was in alaska i think two months after that and that was uh, four years ago now. So hmm. there you go. So was yeah. that the uh, was that the Sweetwater Guide School? Uh, yeah, it was. Cool, yeah. cool. Yeah, I had a past episode. I can't remember which number, but we had Sweetwater on. Well, you probably know. You could probably tell me who it was. I'm trying to think. He's the guy. I think he's running the show there now. Uh, Steve. Uh, Steve. Yeah. What's his last name? Oh, I think it's Wilson. Oh yeah, yep, Steve Wilson, exactly. Yep, Steve Wilson yeah. was on. Yeah, we had a good, good chat. So yeah, so sweet. Uh, you, so you're a good example of the Sweetwater uh, success story. You're you're out there. You've got you've got some work. And how now? How old were you when you first uh, went into the guide school? Uh, I was 26, I guess. Oh yeah, yeah. So you're still you're still young. <laughs> you're still young. Yeah. <laughs> so so 26. So and and what? So how do you go at 26? Did you did you have a kind of a life before the guiding, or what would that look like? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, you know, I did the whole four-year degree thing, and then uh, I was actually working in the family restaurants there for, oh, I guess since I graduated college until until I went to guide school. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I was just kind of looking for a little bit of a change of pace, and yep. yeah, I ended up in Alaska, you know? No kidding. So, so what does it feel like when you, was that the first time the, going to Alaska when you started your job there? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. I was. I was totally green. I'd to- never even been to Alaska. No kidding. And had you guided uh, in? So you did a little bit. Had did you guide before Alaska at all, or was this the first big guiding? No, I didn't. That was you know that was I was pretty lucky to happen into that opportunity. You know, not really having a whole lot of experience, but yeah, uh, that's it. Yeah, I just kind of showed up. They took me under their wing, and you know. It worked out pretty well, I think. Yeah. So, so what did that feel like? So you get up to Alaska for the first time and you jump in and there's bears everywhere. What, what did the whole thing feel like getting off the plane and everything? 
Yeah, it's just a, it's a crazy experience, especially if you've never been up there. You know, I mean, it's it's just like this breathtaking place, and the scenery is amazing, and you're truly in the middle of nowhere. And if you haven't really experienced that before, it's kind of culture shock there for the first little bit. Um, but you know, I think I was looking for something like that, and, and I think I settled in pretty quick. And um, yeah, it's it is a weird experience the first time around, though. <laughs> And, and and so now you're you, you said four years. This is your fourth year, or will will this be this coming summer be your fourth or fifth year? Uh, this will be the fifth. Yeah, fifth year. Okay, so you're so you're into it. And and how long does it take before it seems like with some jobs, you know, you, it feels like to me you, you do it for a couple of years and you got it kind of di- uh, dialed in. Uh, do you feel like you have Alaska totally dialed in? No, no, no. I don't. I don't know. That, I don't know that you can. I you know I I tell everybody I say that the day you stop learning something out there is is probably the day you should call it quits because you might get bored with it. But no, I learn something new every day out there. Yep. Um, you know, certainly you get more accustomed to when things are going to happen in timelines and, you know, where to be and when and things like that. But as far as like something that just makes you go, you know, hmm, every day, yeah, you know, that still happens for sure. That's cool. Uh, I want to jump into that timeline a little bit on just the seasons up there. But um, I can't remember, did you mention where, where were you from in, uh, originally? Where'd you grow up? Uh, I'm from Maryland. Oh, okay. Born and raised. Yeah. There yeah. You go. Still there now. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, so you're still, oh, right, right. Yeah. Because you're all, you're in the off season now. Yeah. Well, yeah, let's, let's dig in. I want to maybe take uh, everybody along on a little journey. You know, I'm thinking of again, that person who maybe hasn't been up to Alaska and experienced the whole thing. So can you take us through like a seasons in the, so if you think of this next year, you're coming up, when do you, when do you first get to Alaska and then take us through the different runs all the way through until you leave? Yeah. So we actually uh, we get up there a little bit earlier than everybody else. We're up there in in May, getting camp open and everything ready for guests and all that. But I guess I guess the heart of it is fishing season starts on June eighth, um, and you know it, we're we're straight into it as far as trout fishing and grailing fishing and things like that. Um, you know we're starting off fishing, you know salmon fry patterns as those fry are pushing down the rivers, and then. Uh, you know, as we progress, we'll get into king salmon season there towards the end of July, or I'm sorry, the end of June, um, and into that beginning part of July. And then uh, as far as salmon go, then we're kind of onto the sockeye pink kind of things, um, and then chums, and then uh, you got your silvers in August into early September. Mm-hmm. But we're fishing, we're fishing rainbows and, and char through that entire period of time. Through the whole time. And, yeah. And when guys are coming up there, do they, do you kind of let people choose what they want? I mean, are they, I guess there's some guys that maybe want to go for all salmon and some, how, how's that usually look on it? I mean, what do you see? Just a little bit of everything? Yeah, I think that, you know, most people want a variety of things. Um, you know, some people want to come up and they, you know, they want to catch some salmon to take home and we'll send them out and they'll knock that out and then they're like, okay, we want to go, we want to go catch rainbows for the rest of the week. Or they might be like, we had a lot of fun catching salmon. We want to go catch some more salmon. So we'll, we're pretty flexible as far as our scheduling. I mean, we meet daily with uh, clients to find out what they want to do for the next day Okay. just to make sure that we're catering exactly to everything they want to do. Yep. That's cool. So, so maybe we could break that down even further. So we, we kind of know the seasons a little bit there. So, you know, when these clients are coming in, typically, I, and we're talking about Keelick Lodge, right? Yeah. Is, is that is that the pr- uh, correct pronunciation? Yeah, yeah, you got it, Keelick Ke- Lodge. Keelick. Um, and so when people come in, are you guys just there? You're there at the, at the lodge waiting for those guys to come in off the, maybe paint that picture. Are they, are they coming down off of a off of a plane, or how's that all look? Yeah, so we have a, we have a dirt airstrip there at the lodge um, that we bring all the guests in through on, and uh, we're doing change days twice a week. And so we'll have uh, clients out fishing in the morning, and then as new clients come in, we're bringing those guys in, and uh, there's kind of just a switch there. So hmm. once you land on the runway, we bring you down to the lodge. It's just a just like a mile and a half, two mile dirt road um, down to the lodge. Give you a brief orientation, kind of figure out what your what your goals are for the week. Give you a rundown of of our scheduling at the lodge and how we work everything. And then from there, we're put we're putting you straight onto the water. So hmm. you're you're fishing the day that you show up at the lodge. No kidding. Yeah. So, so you're going out there. And how do you figure out who, you know, and how many guides are there? First of all, at the, at the uh, we run we run about nine all season long. We'll go up to ten or eleven sometimes oh, a little wow. bit later in the season. Yeah. 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 So you got a bunch. Yeah, almost a dozen people. So so you have all these guides, and then 
how do you choose who you know who goes with who and i mean how do you know who's the experiment what about the you know the brand new fisherman who's never even cast a rod versus the guy who's a super experienced how does that all work Right. Well, yeah, I think any of the people that we have are going to be able to take a new guy out and, and get them dialed in and we'll work with you on your cast and get you into some fish. Um, as far as who's going on, on what fly outs and things like that, that's just going to vary based on where you're going. Um, you know, what guides have been fishing that piece of water and things like that. And we're just going to try to put you in the best situation with the person that's you know most familiar with that piece of water. We're fortunate that we have a lot of returning guides that can kind of do kind of everything that we're doing. Hmm. Um, so we're pretty flexible as far as that goes. But Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's pretty much people. Yeah. That, that's awesome though. The first day. So pretty much somebody, somebody's heading out on that plane, the plane that just comes in drops off guys that are fishing that day. And then there's guys that are hopping on to leave as well. Right. Or, or well, your yeah. changeovers twice a week, you said. Yeah. Yeah. But no, I mean, those, those turnarounds are quick. We're, we're throwing the gear off, throwing, throwing everybody else's gear back on and send yep. it back off to do the next run. That's right. And you're out there. I mean, is it you guys? Are you guys, the guides, uh, I mean, you guys out there just throwing all the bags, doing all the heavy lifting and doing pretty much all that stuff? Yeah, man. I think that anywhere up there, you're, you're, you're not just a fishing guide. There's, yeah, you yep. gotta, you gotta give a hand at everything up there. That's right. That's right. Cool. So what is, so what is the, uh, you know, I guess before we jump into a little more on that, the day in the life sort of thing, you know, is there a, what do you think is the most challenging thing about being a, a guide up there now doing it for four years? Oh man, I think it's just maybe part of it's just kind of the unknown, you know, you have weather to deal with and, you know, the fish up there do move and things like that. And, you know, every day a, yeah. throws you a little bit of a different challenge, but, um, I think the more time you spend, you know, the quicker you can adapt to those kind of things. So that's good. Sure. So, so weather comes in and blows out a river or, well, I guess the rivers don't necessarily blow out that often but just something changes and it makes it difficult or i guess the runs could be down too right and cer- certain runs or they're late or something like that yeah when you're dealing with salmon that that's certainly a factor um you know you can have, the run times do vary a little bit and you know day to day can vary even with those sometimes mm-hmm. okay and who is the out there like the is there the guy as far as the guys are there guys that have been out there i guess doing a long time and is there who, who would be the person that you know, is there one that, I guess Kyle's out there, right? He, is he, is he still, is he still guiding or, well, I guess he's still, he's just running, running things, right? Daily operation. Yeah. He's doing some marketing stuff. Um, back in Anchorage, he was out, uh, he spent a few weeks out with us fishing last year. Um, but he's not, he's not guiding full time or anything yeah. along those lines. Um, then we have our head guide, Kevin, I think he's going on eight years or something along those oh, lines, cool. eight or nine years. Yeah. There you go. Eight or nine years. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And Kyle Shea, I guess for those that hadn't listened to that episode, I, I interviewed him in the past. We talked more, not as much about Keelick, just about some of his, uh, uh, some of the stuff he had done previously, you know, writing and everything at, uh, you know, his, his previous employer, but, um, okay. So, so yeah, let's just go back to that. You know, again, we're getting off the plane, you know, coming in, you got these new guys, you're getting them ready to head out fishing. And then how does, do they, do most guys just kind of go out and jump in and fish the, what's the main river there that, that you can walk to? Yeah. So we're right on the Kulik river. Yeah. Um, and we have, uh, we have jet boats that we keep at the lodge that we use to access the river. Uh, you can also walk down to it, but if you have a guide, you're going to be on a boat so that we can hop around the river as we, okay. as we want to. Um, but yeah, it's just a short little stretch of water. It's a mile and a half long. And, uh, it never blows out or anything like that. You'll have fluctuations in water levels, mm-hmm. but, uh, it, it, it'll fish, it'll fish all season long, yep. which is one of the pretty incredible things about it. No kidding. So, so you, so you jump off, so you get on the boat, go up to the first run or a riffle. Maybe you could talk a little about that just briefly too, about fishing for these, you know, I guess you, you mentioned all the salmon and maybe we could just jump in right in the middle of the summer and talk about coho i guess that's more later but when do you first start getting into coho uh probably mid-august oh, okay yeah. um you start seeing those and that's not something that we're fishing on the Kulik river we're, we're flying out to the coast to fish those guys oh okay but uh yeah we're fishing some really really beautiful coastal water out there and um yeah man when they're in there and, and they're thick it's it's a riot yeah so what, what yeah. does that what does that look like? So you go to the coastal waters. Are you? I mean, you're just just coho. You're swinging them down through. Or are you stripping? Or how, how do you how are you hooking up there? Yeah, yeah, a little bit of both. Um, they seem to like a strip fly a little bit more. 
um, something that's going to give him kind of that that jigging motion, you know, to kind of entice him in there. But um, yeah, basically just stripping flies and yep. you know enticing them in. Sometimes you can get them on top water if you got a lot of them in there, and yep. that can be really cool too. Oh yeah, right. What what do you use? Just a, like a, some sort of a foam fly that kind of shoots across the water. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Basically, a pink mouse essentially is what we usually use. That's right. Something yeah. along those lines. That's right. Pink is the color. Okay, and then also, and then so, what in the the Keelik River? What are the main species that you're getting there? Uh, we're rainbow trout. Okay, so it's, it's yeah. rain, so there's no there's not really any uh, any salmon coming through there. Oh well, we have a huge run of sockeye salmon um, yeah. later in the season, but by the time that they're that far up the system they're already uh they're already turned and they're just in there to spawn so oh, gotcha we're not we're not directly targeting them there you um, go. at that point in time there you go so pretty much when people come up there they're fishing uh you know the keelik river for rainbows they're not really nothing else or, well maybe dollies are really nothing else yeah no we don't really see any char okay. um, we don't really see any grailing in there a yep. few lake trout here and there early in the season but uh so yeah it's mainly rainbows. Yeah, rainbows. Okay, for so, sure. So it's rainbows, and then, like you said, if they come up, say they're in there, say somebody's coming in in mid-August to late August, then the cohort around they're going to come in, maybe fish for a day there, and then they're going to fly out to somewhere to one of the coastal waters. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people that time of year like to go out and, and catch a limit of them, and uh, you know, take them home with them. So we'll definitely try to get them over there, weather permitting, and. Mm-hmm. Um, and get that done. Hmm. So what does a day look like on, on the, I mean, so you go for these coho, you're out there, you're all geared up. I mean, are guys just, you drop them off and just start, you know, fish, fish after fish. I mean, how many, how many fish are people hooking up? What, what's a good day and what's a bad day? Oh man. Well, you know, we try to, we try to always make sure everybody gets a limit at least. Um, which is what, which is, uh, I think it was three last year. Three. Okay. Three per yeah. day. Um, so we at least try to get you there. You know, some days, uh, some days you catch 30, you know, I mean, yeah. it's one of those things. If you get a good push the day before, you know, they're, they're there and you're just gonna, you know, sometimes you can go, you can't even cast without hooking up. Right. Um, you know, those are, those are kind of the, the epic days. Um, but you know, even on slow days, you're going to hook a few good fish uh-huh. and you know, you're going to get your fights in and you know, Lord willing, we'll bring you home with a limit and yep. be in good shape. So pretty much in the limit. So you, so guys catch three a day, and then they're bringing home a just kind of a box, freeze up the fish, and bringing a box of fish home. Yeah. So we'll uh, we'll clean them up when we get them back to the lodge. We have a vacuum sealer and all that. We'll fillet them out however you want them. Uh, pack them up, freeze them, and we'll send them on the plane home with you. Yep. And that, and that's typically people aren't messing with. Um, this is mostly a silver thing. They're they're not really keeping uh, sockeye or or chinook or anything like that no we'll we'll keep uh we'll keep the kings during king season you know we'll do those also and then uh sockeye too we'll fish we'll fish to to catch those for meat too okay yeah okay that's kind of a july type deal that the the sockeye sockeye. well yeah all right so if you want so july is kind of a sockeye kings you still get the kings in there yeah, you get a little bit of that mix at the beginning of the, uh, the month there. Okay. So if you were coming up there, you know, knowing what you know now, um, I mean, I guess you, you fish for a lot, so maybe it's not, it's not a good example. But if you had to pick one uh, week or two-week period of time to go fish Alaska, you know, what, what would it be? You know, that's a, we get that question all the time, and it's a tough question. It kind of depends on what you want to do. Yeah. Um, earlier in the season, you're going to be fishing uh, – you know, we're going to be fishing fry patterns, which is kind of akin to almost dry fly fishing. Um, you know, if you really like to swing flies and you kind of want to play the spay game and things like that, you're going to want to be there in June and July. And then, uh, you know, some guys like to do that thing. They don't want to stare at an indicator fishing beads behind salmon all day. And then you have your crowd that, that you know, they want to indicator fish and they want, they want those high fish, you know, those high number days. And then that time to be there is going to be, you know, August and August and all the way through September. Mm-hmm. Okay. And what are you, so indicator, so what are you indicator fishing for mainly? Uh, you're going to be, uh, rainbows and char behind this, behind the sockeye. Oh, okay. Behind the spawn and salmon. Yeah. Yep. So pretty much, so beads indicator, so you can do that a lot for the rainbows and then, and pretty much for, are you also getting into any, any pink or chum out there? Yeah. 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 We do, uh, we do a little bit of chum fishing. Um, you know, if somebody wants to just go out and catch salmon and we're kind of in that, 
lull period, then we'll, we'll send them out and we'll catch some chums. And, you know, they're cool fish, man. They look awesome and they're big mm-hmm. and they fight hard and they eat a fly well. Um, and then uh, on pink years, you're you're catching pinks, you know, if, even if you're out, you know, fishing for silvers or sockeye yeah, or whatever. They're just in there. Yeah. But was it a pink year? When, when was the pink? Is it a pink year this year? Uh, this year will be, yeah. Will Typically be. even years. E- oh, that's right, yeah. So it's a pink year. So, okay, so that's, uh, yeah, I mean, it seems like there's a lot. I mean, I guess if I was going to say I want to catch as many species as possible, w- what would you say would be the best time? Uh, if you're looking for that, probably maybe late July, mm-hmm. you know, early August, something along those lines. You can get to, your, yeah. you know, we got the grailing, the char, the rainbows, you know, sockeyes and silvers. Oh, right. and That's right. Yeah, you have a good chance of getting a mix right in there. Yeah, yep. That's right. Well, I guess I had a couple of questions here. One of the things is it sounds like, you know, when you hear Alaska, it sounds like it's kind of a, anybody can catch them up there and, it, you know, but is there anything to, you know, are there any, any bonus tips or anything you would say somebody maybe that's going up there? Maybe think about somebody, what if they didn't have a guide? What would you tell them if they were going to go catch, they wanted to catch salmon? What, what, what sort of tip would you give them? Yeah. Typically you're going to find them holding in that, that kind of inside seam type yeah. type things and that's okay. slower water you're going to be yep. looking for them in there casting across them and just it just stripping it they're not eating it just strip it faster you know yep you got to make those things chase it you got to make them eat it you do and what's the strip look like is it a kind of a long pull or is it ever fast pull or no just kind of short strips you know yep. a few inches and and rapid fire rapid fire just boom 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 yeah. boom boom. yeah just keep hitting them yep and then they chase it i mean they're chasing it all the way in Oh yeah. Yeah. You'll, you'll see them coming. They'll be waking on it. Sometimes they're so shallow chasing that thing. Oh, cool. And then, and then you occasionally are swinging it too without stripping in certain areas. Yeah. You know, that's, that's kind of a condition dependent thing. I wouldn't say that it's, that it's that's not that successful common. or anything like that. It's just kind of give it a shot and if that's gotcha. not working. Kind of a on type deal. Okay. And then also, um, and then what about Chinook? So, so are guys, guys aren't really swinging Chinook up on the fly or fishing for them on the fly there too often? Uh, not where we're fishing. We're fishing down on the new Shigak. Um, and that's the only way we're fishing for those guys is we're, we're gear, gear trolling. Um, it's just, it's a big river and it's a lot of water. What are you expecting for this year? Do you have a feel for the runs? I mean, is there a potential they're, they're up or they're down or is it, are you guys pretty confident what it's going to look like? You know, it's always hard to say, um, the, you know, the Chinook run was not as good last year as it has been. We had some really good days, um, but it didn't quite last as long as it had in some previous years. As far as sockeye numbers go, they seem to be doing just fine. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, same thing with the cohos. It, it looks pretty good. I mean, I don't see any reason for, for any, you know, any difference in that. Gotcha. Um, Well, from your perspective, you know, you've been doing this now for four, this is going to be your fifth year. <clears throat> what would you say, you know, when you think about things that you've learned up there, is there anything that you've learned that kind of, you feel like, you know, you've got some inside secrets on, you know, the, the fishing up there, or is there, is there anything, you know, anything that somebody wouldn't know that maybe, again, if I was coming up there and I hadn't fished it yet, what, what would, what would you be telling me on the first day? <laughs> yeah you, you spend a lot of time on that first day just getting in you know dialed in on your presentation and things like that and kind of preparing you mm-hmm. and then uh you know just those just those subtle things there's going to be some some differences and some drift and you know getting that mend in there right getting your fly down to the right level if you're swinging flies you know if you're drifting indicator rigs making sure that your drift is good um you know those big rainbows they're, they're there but they can they can be picky you know, it's not just, not just chucking, chucking beads in and swinging them around and they're jumping on there. You know, if those, those, if you're going to be targeting some of those bigger fish, you still have to be on top of your game as far as presentation and things like that go. Um, and that's really, really important yep. up there. So, yep. Okay. So the, and what, what would you say are the hardest out of all the species up there? I guess, uh, rainbows, I guess maybe w- which ones are the hardest ones to, to hook up with? Oh man, if you're in the right place. You know, it can kind of go, kind of go any way, but, yeah. uh, you know, maybe even, even though we're gear trolling those Kings, you know, sometimes that can be difficult. Uh-huh. Um, just trying to find them, things like that. That can be one of the tougher things to find on that big water. Um, but yeah, I mean, 
as long as you're as long as you're in the right place doing the right thing, I think I think you stand some pretty good odds. Okay. Oh yeah. So again, it's not not a. Uh, you guys can get so you get the you get the most rookie person who you know is struggling to even cast. I mean, how does that ever happen? Yeah, that yeah, we have uh, we have some people that come up that you know haven't fished a lot or or they're yep. they're they're your once in a year kind of fishermen or one trip a year type thing. And, yep. Um, you know, that's one of the advantages of being able to fish that day that you get into the lodge. You know, we get down there on the Kulik for a few hours, get you dialed in, get you a couple of fish, get you ready for your fly outs. Yeah. Um, and that way you're good to go for the week. And I think, you know, any of our guys up there are more than willing to help you out and, and yeah. get you dialed in on all that stuff. So, yep. Okay. Have you ever had any, um, you know, challenging, uh, situations up there challenging? I mean, it must be a thing. You got these people a lot of times, right? Just kind of, maybe they're not all in the same group. Uh, or how does that work when people come up? Are they typically all coming off the plane in one group or do you get a mixed match of people that don't, don't know each other? Um, we don't have a whole lot of single shares up there as far as, you know, people coming individually that we have to yeah. mix in with other groups. You know, there are some, of course. Yep. Um, but typically, you know, we're just trying to split your groups, uh, you know, two to a guide. And, uh, you know, if you got a group of six, then we'll, we'll try to fish you all together if we can. Yeah. Um, but you know, the fishing community, even if you do have a single share in there with you, typically they're, they're a pretty cool guy yeah. or a pretty cool girl, you know, pretty just, cool. they just want to hang out and go fishing and, yeah. you know, just doing it with some new people and most yeah. people kind of enjoy it. I've heard a couple, I mean, obviously there's going to be bad, you know, bad stories in any line of work. I've heard some kind of crazy stories. I mean, it's interesting, you know, I think of the, um, you know, what if you had to give somebody, you know, that hadn't ever been up with a guide before you wanted to give them a little tip on how to get, you know, maybe be a good client or get the most out of their trip. What, what would you tell that person? Yeah, I would say just be, be straight up, just be, right off the bat, just be straightforward with what your expectations are, what you think your skill level is. Um, yeah. And, you know, from there, you know, your guide's probably seen a lot of that kind of stuff before. So they're going to put you in the spot where, where, you know, your expectations are met and you can do it with the skill level that you have. And we'll work on improving that throughout the week. And, you know, yeah, I just think being straightforward, you know, with your expectations and what you're trying to get out of the trip is, is the most important thing versus us running around guessing what you want to do. And now a quick word from our sponsor. FTJ Spring Edition is packed with the best fly tying instruction, fly fishing techniques, destination articles, and fly fishing stories. Here are a few of the featured fly tires in the Spring Edition of the Fly Fishing and Tying Journal. Master Fly Tire Dave McNeese begins his multi-part tutorial on the secrets of dyeing your own materials. I know this is a hot topic because I've been uh, hearing about it from some listeners of the podcast, so this is going to be a big one. This is going to be super helpful. Uh, we find out also how to tie big durable flies for predator, uh, predatory fish, an effective uh, cicada pattern, and we hear about a 14-year-old uh, fly tire who's who's kicking some butt out there, uh, lining up sponsors and ambassadors so we're, we get to hear that story in the uh in the spring edition also gary lewis gives us a little rundown on diamond lake as he heads out there and we're also going to be heading to san diego with joe warren who talks about tuna dorado wahoo and more dave hughes provides a tribute to frank amato in in the dish the spring edition and we get an update on the short story contest Lots of additional content in this one, so uh, head over to ftjangler.com and subscribe so you don't miss any of the tips, tricks, and stories in the next issue. That's ftjangler.com to get started today. Uh, tell them uh, you heard uh, about the uh, the magazine from the podcast, and I'll figure out a way to make it up to you. Okay, back to the show. So, so what is the next, so now, you know, again, you're just looking at kind of what you have going. It sounds like you're in this, you know, this place is pretty amazing, right? I mean, everybody, you know, who doesn't want to go up to the, the, what is it called? It's the first fly out lodge, right? Keelick. Yeah, it's got, it's got a lot of history with it all the way back to the fifties. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it was pretty much the first one there and yeah. it kind of started a whole thing. It's it's pretty neat the history that's associated with it. So, what is that when you get to? So again, I guess we could bring it back to you know that you know getting off the plane, going in. What what is the lodge? What what is it? Can you kind of describe what that looks like when you go in? Are these? Is this one big lodge? Are these a bunch of different buildings? What does all that look like? 
Yeah, so the main lodge is, you know, original from back in the 50s, and it's still got the old stone fireplace in it. And it's been uh, expanded a little bit, tad a, a little bit onto it, but most of it is just that same original, you know, old log building. Um, so that's really cool. And then all the guest cabins are, are separate, separate guest cabins um, for each group. And uh, we actually just redid a bunch of those this year. So we got, uh, I guess, eight new cabins out there for, for guests to be in. But they're mm-hmm. still original structures. The office is all original and, the you know, the original lodge and all that. Yeah. So it's, so it's pretty cool. And you have bear, bears running around all over the place out there? Yeah. Yeah. Depending on the time of the year, definitely. Um, especially that later season, August and September. Uh, man, they're, they're thick over there. They're yeah. all over the place. Yeah, yeah. How do you, you know, somebody again is coming up there. How, how do they, what do you recommend they do for, you know, like preparing for the trip other than, you know, obviously you get the gear and everything. Do you tell them anything else to how they can get ready for something like that? Yeah, just be prepared. You know, I guess you mentioned the gear and all that. That's, yeah. uh, that's certainly a component of it. Um, you know, and then just work on your cast, get dialed in there, mm-hmm. you know, just so you're, you're just coming up ready to rock. And uh, how far do you have to be able to ca- what What's a good distance of being accurate for up there? Oh, uh, you know, I mean, it's one of those things that the, the further is the better, but yeah. we're not casting anywhere. If you can get it out there, you know, 30 and 40 feet, I mean, we're fishing, yeah, you're we're fishing. fishing, we're fishing well. Yep. Um, anything so, over that is a bonus. And sometimes you don't, sometimes you only need 10. You yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. So it's, so these rivers aren't, these aren't huge rivers. I mean, are they, are most of the rivers pretty similar in size or is there a big variation? Uh, they're all pretty similar. Um, yeah, they're all pretty similar. Yeah. They're not super wide. Um, and you know, there's a lot of sight fishing opportunities in close and things like that too. So that's always cool. Okay. So, so sight fishing, you mean just the fish are just hanging there and you're just kind of swinging it or stripping it right into them? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, in that mid part of the season, sometimes you get some risers around. You can throw some dry flies at them. Um, you know, grailing are kind of notorious for eating dry flies. And oh yeah. Then, uh, yeah, and when those salmon are in there to spawn, and you can you can pick out the fish behind them, and you can actually pick out and try to fish individual fish, which is always a good oh, time. Cool. Cool. So you're picking off just rainbows or whatever dolly sitting behind them. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Huh. Nice. Okay. Cool. So I guess that gives us a little bit of a perspective on, you know, again, I'm trying to think of if there's anything, you know, any other, any, anything we're missing here for somebody that's going to be coming up the, for the first time, but it sounds like it's fairly straightforward and you kind of just get up there and just get on the river and start casting, huh? Yeah, man, we just try to get you out fishing as soon as possible. Um, you know, as long as you show up prepared and ready to go, be ready yeah. for the weather and we'll get you out there fishing. We'll get you dialed in. Um, you know, we keep a steady, big supply of things at the lodge. So, like, if you do forget something, oh, we right, probably right. got you covered. Do you guys? So, what do you recommend people bring? I mean, would you have everything they need if they, I guess, if they forgot stuff? You have rods, reels, waders, everything. Yeah, yeah, we can fully equip you. Rods, reels, waders. The only thing that we don't carry for you is rain jackets. Um, okay. So make sure you got a good rain jacket for yep. sure, because we're putting in long days on the water. They're not. Yeah, I'm not running three and four hour stints. You're out there for eight, ten hours are sometimes. You? So, so what do you so, so when you get even when you're at the at the Kulik River, you guys are out there for eight hours. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We fish ten hour. We fish ten hour days on the Kulik. Ten hour days. So you get up in the morning. Say if you're again thinking of the the summer, you're out there. You're getting up at what time? What time are you heading out in the boat? Uh, we're off the beach at at seven o'clock. So, so you're fishing by five after seven. So there you go. So seven o'clock. So, so you're, and then how many different runs are you hitting? And, and then seven. So you're going to seven till seven, seven to five or seven to five. Yeah. So seven to five. Yeah. So in that day, how many different runs are you hit or different spots are you hitting? Uh, that'll be condition dependent. Um, you know, some days you can get out there and, and you can hang out and you can camp on a spot. Mm-hmm. Um, other days we'll bounce around the river, even if it's just to, you know, try different spots or see, see a little bit different water. Um, you know, there's some different water on the key from the bottom to the top. And, uh, sometimes it's fun just to get bounced around and, and try different areas and mm-hmm. a little bit different runs and some different techniques in different spots. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're fortunate that we have the, the jet boats there and we're flexible on it. We can move around you know, pretty much at will. 
Yeah. So you just go find a run, fish it, get some fish and just keep kind of working your way. I mean, are there other, and there, there's a few other lodges right there. So there's other boats and people on the river. Uh, not necessarily other boats. There's only one other lodge, um, that's on the lake there that will bring boats across the lake that can fish it also. Okay. Um, but there will be, there will be some other lodges. They'll drop up at the top and, uh, and raft down to the bottom. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So we do see some of that and then, uh, some people just, just flying in and just fishing one, one spot. Gotcha. Um, so, so, so yeah, you do see a little bit of that out there. Yeah. Cause that, that is the, um, is it a national park or, or that area? Yeah, we're. Yeah. yeah, we're right in Katmai National yeah, Park. Yeah, it's, it's in Katmai. So this is a national park. So this is a, so you got people coming in. I mean, well, obviously it's mostly focused on fishing, but yeah, that, that makes sense. So, so it is a place that, that at least that area you could, you could get to, you could actually, it'd be a nice flight though, right? Because you, people are just coming straight over from Anchorage for the, for the most part. Is that, is that what they're doing? Uh, those guys fishing are coming from, from other area lodges. Oh, other lodges. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 yeah they're just dropping up there. Okay. Right. And they're okay. just there for the day, and then and then they're kind of out of there. Gotcha. Um, you mentioned gear a few seconds ago. I want to touch on that. Is there a um, you know now that you're out there? I mean, you're outdoors, um, you know, all summer long. And any is there a go to piece of gear that you kind of don't you know leave the uh, the room without that you got to have every day? Yeah, um, you know, a, a dry bag for sure, mm-hmm. and uh, and and good sunglasses. Those are. Those yep. are number ones what, for what do me you, for sure. What do you have a what are your dry what's your ba- brand for dry bags and glasses? Uh this past year I was using uh one of those Yeti Panga fifties. Yep. And that's uh that's working out really well for me. It's a pretty good size for it holds most of my guide stuff pretty well. Uh huh. Um and then Costa sunglasses for and the Costa. most part. And coast. Yeah. Okay. What is your goal just from a, you know, a personal perspective? Are you trying to, I guess, is that how it works? Do you see a lot of guys, you know, you, you're put, getting your right, putting your time in up in Alaska. It's amazing, but you are putting your time in and then eventually maybe get on with another shop or lodge or how's that? What do, what do you think in there? Yeah. So, you know, we'll kind of see where we wind up. I think that uh, definitely I'll be staying in the industry in some, in some capacity, mm-hmm. um, you know, whether that's guiding or, or, you know, working for for a company industry or whatever yeah um but yeah alaska's uh you know there's not too many people that that hang out up there forever it's yeah. uh it's <laughs> what, pretty, what is it's, it's pretty is, it's pretty tough <laughs> is eight years is the eight-year guide is that a pretty he's uh right there you said he's the oldest guy it's been eight he's, years right? yeah yeah definitely um you know there's some guys that have been there been up there a long long time and if it gets in your blood i can certainly see where it happens but yeah it's uh yeah, maybe it's a young man's game. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems like I guess yeah, it would make sense, right? Because it, it's hard to you're probably not have it bringing your family up there, right, for that time. And yeah, there's there's certainly uh, certainly some difficulties there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What would you say for somebody? I'm not sure if you're in. I mean, obviously you're working for a lodge here, and you know, I think for those people that have the resources, doing a lodge trip is is amazing, and you know, I hope to do, you know, some of that as well, but you know, for somebody that maybe doesn't have the, the chunk of money that it takes to hit a, a key lick or some of those, what would you recommend if somebody wanted to do get the Alaska thing? Would you have any, any tips for them? Yeah. I mean, there's certainly some, you know, you can do some of these, uh, you know, you'd still be through an outfitter, but you're not doing the guided thing and all that. And you can, you can do some of these week long floats down some of these rivers and oh, yeah. you're going to have to have some kind of, you know, outdoor and outdoor savvy and things like that to be you know to be running and camping on your own um but that's probably a good option um you know and there's there's good fishing to be had you know just outside of anchorage too all right you know if you want to want to kind of get up there and just fish fish around there or the kenai or things like that i think that would be kind of a cool thing to do and i'll bet you i'll bet you if you do the outfitter thing you could probably do it for probably half the cost right of, of a lodge thing if not lower yeah, yeah, I would think so. Something like that. Yeah, I just kind of rent, rent the raft in the in the air flight time to get you in and out. Get you in and out, exactly. Yeah, that's a, so okay. So that that gives uh, definitely some people, you know, some some things to think about on, on that end. Um, yeah, well, let's let's wrap it up here. I had a, just a couple of quick questions for you um, before we head out of here, and um, you know, I guess more sticking on the on those resources things. You know, again, if somebody was planning a trip either up to Keelick or just heading to Alaska, is there any are there any resources that you would recommend for you know to dial in? I mean, we we kind of just touched on. You know, we didn't really touch on chum, soccer, any of that other stuff. Like book, magazine, resources, anything comes to mind? 
Yeah, you know, I just I'm a big kind of internet like YouTube scour, mm-hmm. um, and there's a lot of good information. You know, it's it's okay to click on the second page of Google. Yeah, and, and look, look a little bit deeper into some of this stuff, and I think you'll find a lot of good good blog posts and, and videos and things like that. Um, yep. You know, you just gotta you just kind of kind of find the information that's in, you know that's kind of scattered throughout all these magazines and publications and things like that. Yeah. Um, as yeah. far as a centralized resource resource for yeah. for just kind of visiting Alaska, I'm not sure that I have a direct one for you. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of interesting because you know, yeah, if you do a little googling, there is some stuff out there. You know, OPST has stuff. I mean, obviously, uh, Danicky, you know, with all that stuff, Kyle, and you know, but it, yeah, he's put up a lot of good. He's stuff. put up a lot. Yeah, yeah. It seems like there's not. I mean, I kind of look at the podcasting thing, and there's not a lot of the Pacific salmon. And maybe it's just because it's kind of new. There will eventually. I think I might have the most Alaska podcasts that are on, you know, <laughs> around the world right now because I've interviewed, you know, I've interviewed a number of people. I've, uh, I'm just kind of interested in, you know, I mean, I've been up there, but it's been a long time. And, you know, I just think I, I actually did a survey last year asking some of the lis- listeners, you know, where they had loved to go, you know, and Alaska was the the number one place, you know? Yeah, so, I, be- I believe yeah. it. I believe it. It's, it's, uh, you know, it has, it has an outstanding reputation. That's for a reason. Yeah. We have a lot of really good days up there for sure. Totally. totally. What about, um, you know, I don't uh, ask this question too often, but just thinking about, you know, do you have any, uh, like a conservation um, topic issue or any sort of a thing that you're, you know, on top of mind for you? I'm not sure either back home, um, you know, or in Alaska. Does anything come to mind when you think, I'm not sure if you dig into any of that at all, or if there's something we could highlight there? Yeah, I think that the biggest one that you're going to find with, with especially people in Alaska is going to be a pebble mine. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's huge. Um, and that is right there in your back door. The Pell mine would affect Keelick or would it affect that area? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just, it's right up there at the headwaters, of Lake Iliamna, which is, you know, it's not far from us at all. And, uh, yeah, it's kind of a scary proposition. Um, there's a, you know, they're working on getting some good information out, out there about it. You have the say Bristol Bay and people like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if that's something that you're interested in, I encourage everybody to go in and doing doing their own research on it, yep. and uh, kind of draw on some conclusions. But that's that's the big one up there cool. for sure. Cool. Yeah. No, I'm glad you highlighted that. I totally had forgotten. I was, wasn't even thinking Bristol Bay, but obviously that's where we're talking about here. And yeah, I've got a act the um, uh, somebody from Trout Unlimited. I can't remember her name, but she's going to come on here next month and do a, a update of Bristol Bay because I know they're going through some some ups and downs with the change of the administration and like the permitting's back on track now and stuff. So I'm going to give a little update and help people. Yeah. I think, I think that's the key with it. I think the biggest key is that the reason why it didn't go forward before was they had a couple million people come out and basically say, no, you know, we don't, we don't want this to happen. So we need that to happen again this round. And, um, so I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes to, to that, um, to the, to that link. So people can sign up for the, the petition or whatever. And, um, yeah, thanks for reminding me about that. Yeah. The more, the more support we can get going on that, the, the better for yeah. everybody involved. Definitely. All right, cool. Bryce, well, uh, before I uh, let you get out of here, uh, we, I always kind of wrap it up with the 222, which is top two, uh, flies, top two tips, top two resources. And maybe we can just keep it on coho. I know coho seems to be the, it almost seems like it's the one that's too easy to talk about, but do you have, is there a couple, are there any named flies that people could search on Google for coho or is it all just, you throw a pink thing on there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of pink, a lot of pink. Yeah. Uh, no, you do have to switch it around sometimes. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> But but it's 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 pretty basic yeah. as far as fly patterns for those guys goes. Yeah. You can get as fancy as you want, but but just a good old pink pink yeah. string leech well, is going to do you just fine. What if you just had wanted to take two flies for just in general for salmon for Pacific salmon? Is, is there something? Could you get that general on it? Or is that hard? Yeah, I mean you, you can't to an extent. You know they're gonna they're gonna eat you know just like a pink string leech and yeah and i'd have a chartreuse backup yeah that's it okay I would have. So, yeah so pink and chartreuse and then what about a couple of just general tips you know if you just had somebody's coming up again you know they're maybe they have a little bit of experience and they're going for i don't know any of these species we're talking about would you give them a couple of anything you could throw out there yeah be prepared for the weather mm-hmm. and uh you know just come ready to fish hard yeah and you know you're gonna you're gonna get rewarded if you put in your time. Yep. So it, what happens if a guy's out there? So you're out there for seven to five, and and he's just you know maybe he's an older guy or whatever, and he he's just done after six hours. Is that uh, 
you know, could, do people just sit back in the boat sometimes if they're having a rough day, or does that never happen? No, I, no, that does happen absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes people fish for for a couple hours and they're like, "We just want to check out the view for a couple hours." And there you go. That's one hundred percent okay. Yep. Yep. And, and are you guys doing? I know there's some uh, companies out there now that are doing more of the. Not only Alaska, but they're doing that. Where right, I don't know. Even though I guess Eleven Experience is one that comes to mind. Where they're, they're. It's not just the fishing, right? You can go up there, and I don't know, go hiking, go skiing, depending on where you're at. Um, it, up there, a bear watching, right? I mean, aren't you guys in one of those places that's kind of a hot place for watching bears? Yeah, we do. We do have uh, quite a few bear viewing guests, um, mainly during July, which is which was when everybody was over on uh, over on the Brooks River which you may have heard of yeah, that's where, yeah, the, the where the waterfall with the salmon and all that's that is. It. So, so yep. we'll do some people through our lodge there. Um, yep. and we'll just fly them over there for the day and they just go hang out and, and check out the bears and, and check out the sites over there. So yep. definitely it. we have some of that going on. That's it. Cool. And, uh, and just a couple of random ones before, before I let you go here. Um, so uh, rod reel line, what, what, what are your, do you have any companies you kind of, uh, go with? You know? Uh, I think I got a little bit of everything, yeah. everything in my bag, but yep. a seven weight rod for sure. Um, if you're just going to have one line, just make it, make it a weight forward floating line. Okay. Um, you know, earlier in the season, you might want a little bit of a sink tip, but nothing too heavy, maybe yep. like a type three or something along those lines. Okay. And are, and are you a, uh, are you like a sage guy or do you have any, uh, as far as the companies, you kind of use a little bit of everything? Yeah, I use a little bit of everything. Sage rods are great. Um, yep. hatch reels. Yep. And, uh, yeah, Air, airflow. Airflow lines are good. Yeah, yeah. I like them a lot. Okay. Yeah, I have a couple on some of my rods it, now. It's interesting because I love asking that occasionally because you know it's just, there's so many good companies. You know what I mean? But I love hearing, and it seems like you know these companies keep coming up. I mean, obviously Hatch is good. You know, there's a lot of great companies out there. It was interesting because I was talking to uh, recently uh, Klaus uh, Freemore or Fr- Freemore. I guess I always pronounce that wrong, but he designs uh, loop rods, right? Mm-hmm. And we were talking about the Scandi. Are anybody, are they doing, I mean, do you see guys, I mean, it's a Skagit game out there, right? For the spin. Yeah, yeah, for the most part. Yeah. Because we're throwing those heavier flies for totally, sure. Totally, Yeah, it was interesting because he got into a whole thing on Scandi and how people in the U.S. don't really understand it. You know what I mean? Like, it's a total different thing. And I didn't really either until he described it. So I'll put a link to that one too if people want to check out some different things that I think um, maybe Loop and some of those, you know, they're doing with the Scandi stuff. Um so one more, I got, I can't, I can't let you go without a, without a random one. So in, um, so if you look at, uh, back to high, what was the name of your high school? Uh, Thomas Johnson. Thomas Johnson. And yep. Thomas Johnson high school. Okay. And what, what was the city? Uh, Frederick, Maryland. Frederick. Okay. Frederick, Maryland. And were you a, so would you say a good student or bad student? <laughs> did you get in trouble? Oh, geez. I did not. I think I was, I think I was pretty good as far as the getting in trouble thing yep. went. There you go. And, uh. You know the grades were all right too. So there you go. So, so yeah, you're good. So that's probably better than me. I, I uh, on mine, I kind of barely squeaked by just because uh, you know I kind of got. I think I was hanging with the wrong kids. But no, it, it's cool to hear, man. I, I think the uh, your story is interesting because I mean you kind of started your you know you're on this track and you, you did just what Steve you know was talking about with Sweetwater. I mean you jumped in. You know you're still young, obviously, but you know you're kind of going for it. So it's a cool story. I think it's inspirational, probably for you know I know a lot of young guides and people that are interested in touch, you know, kind of touching the water, testing it out or are, are probably listening. So uh, any, any words of advice for them? If there's a person that hasn't gone in yet and done it, what would you say to that person that's maybe thinking about guiding? Yeah, you just gotta, you just gotta go do it. You know, you just stop putting it off. You just gotta, you just gotta get out there and do it. And it's, it was certainly worth it in my, in my case, you know, you can't trade those experiences for anything. So yeah. Yep. That's it. And you're not thinking about, uh, packing it up and going back to the office. You're, you're, you're loving it. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't see myself at a desk job anytime soon. No, nope. put it that way. Cool. All right, Bryce. Well, Hey, in the next uh, six months or so, anything, um, you know, I mean, you guess what are we at now? You got six months. You're going to be right in the heat of the season, right? Yeah. We'll be in the thick of it, man. Yep. Um, so yeah, just kind of prepping to get back up there. Um, going down to fish the white for a few days here. Oh, really? Okay. And, uh, yeah, so a little trip there before the season. And, uh, uh-huh. then we're just, then we're back on the grind. We're going to, it's time to go fishing again. That's it. Do you, uh, you ever run into Davey Watton down there? I actually, I haven't been down there. This will be the first trip. Oh, cool. So. There you go. Yeah, the white, that's definitely a destination you hear a lot about. 
That's yeah. Cool. All right, Bryce, well, I'll let you get out of here. Um, so I guess uh, fish on fly 56 on Instagram. Is that correct? You got it. All right, man. Hey, thanks again for uh, sharing, uh, shedding some light on, uh, you know, the Alaska experience. I'm going to hopefully I've been talking to Kyle about it. Hopefully put something together with, you know, some people up there. We'll see. I'm not sure if it's going to be this year, but um, hopefully we'll get up there soon. And maybe I'll see you on the river, man. We'll have a have a beer and uh, maybe get some Sam. That'd be cool. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, all right. Hey, thanks again. Yeah, thanks for having me. Okay. See ya. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, you can go to wetflyswing.com slash 130. If you're interested in a trip to uh, Kulik Lodge and want to join me and a few of the listeners from this podcast, head over to wetflyswing.com slash AK, and I'll follow up with you with uh, some details there. That's wetflyswing.com slash AK. Thanks again for stopping by. Check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up soon. Hope maybe see you on the line or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. Hey, before I get out of here, I wanted to share a fun story with you. Uh, give you a little insight. We were... Uh, this, uh, this past week, we were out fishing with Jack up north, and uh, randomly by the cabin, a guy by the name of, um, well, <laughs> Joe Donsky was his name, but he was talking about his daughter, and the, basically the story, here's how it went. We were, we were chatting there just about fishing. He was coming out for a day of fishing, and, and we kind of got to talking, and it turned out that, um, that my dad had built him uh, one of his first fly rods, I believe. It was a little two weight and it was just a cool story because he had a picture of it with uh, his daughter and I think it was the rod that he first got his daughter into fly fishing with and I just want to read a little, he sent a text back and um, he sent me a photo of the rod um, which I'll put a link um, or put a photo of that um, that rod but what he said is, um, um, he said uh, when, you're, when my dad made this rod, um, he was about 23 years old and had no idea of its significance nor the power of my passion for fishing and who, if anyone, I would be sharing it with. Um, I just wanted to go fishing is what uh, Joe said. So it's pretty awesome. It turns out that that rod helped him, you know, get going on it. And eventually his daughter even was using it. So it just shows you the power of uh, what one rod, um, you know, by somebody, my dad who made plenty of rods and so I just love hearing that connection. So Joe, uh, I'm not sure if you're going to be listening to this. Shout out to you. I know um, Orvis, we talked about that. You were an Orvis rep for a while. So shout out to Orvis as well. And uh, I think, yeah, I think this is just a fun story. And I wanted to throw that in there. Um, you know, I don't talk about my dad a ton on here because I've kind of been doing, you know, my own, my own show. But yeah, for those that, you know, maybe remember him, um, it's a cool story. And, you know, obviously um, a guy that had an impact on, on me as well. So that's it. Maybe we'll have another fun story for you next week. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to go too deep on some of this, but there's definitely some cool little nuggets I'll throw in there. And uh, if you enjoy these, uh, if you enjoy this and you want to hear more of these little snippets, maybe at the end, uh, send me an email, let me know, or a message on social, and uh, and I'll maybe do more of these. So, all right, out of here. 